present if God's been good to you come on give him one more praise come on and give him one more one more one more come on while worshipers are still coming in come on and fill the room bless God for our online congregation who meet with us every week. God bless you. Would you celebrate the music ministry of our church? So thankful and so grateful to you. Thank God for our minstrels, uh, these mighty men of music as they play upon the instruments for our vocalists, for our minister of music. Thank God for our media ministry, uh, not only getting sound here, but getting sound all over the world where people in the military are watching us. Praise God for our children, our youth, and our nursery workers. Would you celebrate them? They're all over the bill. All, they're over there and over there and over there. And uh, we celebrate all of them today. You ready for the word? Yeah. Would you open your Bibles uh, to the passage? I'm still trying to learn to not say bulletins, so your Bibles, um, or just look on the overhead. Uh, Minister Patrick Jackson has led us so well in the reading and hearing of it. We are so happy to have him home. He's just finished up his Masters of Divinity at uh, uh, Cornwall. Just, was it Judson Cornwall? Where were you? What, what seminary were you at? Andover Newton, at Andover Newton. Uh, many of you know that uh, Patrick is an attorney by trade. He has his Juris Doctorate and was a practicing attorney and the Lord called him to ministry and he went back to school, got an MDiv on top of his JD and uh, we're just excited for him and happy for him and glad when he's home. We're glad to have him. So he is one of our beloved sons in whom we are extremely well pleased. And we give thanks to God for him. He's read the text, the context. So would you read the text with me, verses 14 and 15 of Philippians chapter 2. I talked about the fact in the introduction at 8, I'm not going to linger or labor on this long, that in this portion of this pericope, this portion of this passage, Paul comes now to practical application. Having dealt with spiritual principles, the exaltation of Christ, the divesting of Christ in the earlier verses, he comes now to practical application. Verses 14 and 15, let's read it together. Do all things without murmuring and arguing so that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation in which you shine like stars in the world. You can be seated in the presence of our awesome God. Beloved, all of this weekend, last night, 8 o'clock today, and in this service, we are bringing to a close the series for the month of September on being a new and better you. Now, Sam, you may recall that this series uh, that we began the first Sunday in this month has coincided and corresponded with our re-entry into our sanctuary after a three-month retrofit of this room that we are currently sitting in. And when we came back, Marcia, into this sanctuary, we said as a church, we said as a congregation that we not only want to go back into a retrofitted, remodeled building, but that we wanted to be new and better people in that building. So to that end, beloved, we have been looking at the various aspects and components of this desire in our hearts as the people of God to be new and better people in a new and better building. 
throughout this month, I have sought to lift before you the steps, might and the stages, the processes by which that will happen. And so we've looked at the promise of a new and better you, that if anyone be in Christ, they are a new creation. We looked at the process of a new and better you. That it does not happen by osmosis. It does not happen simply by desire. But there is a process that we must go through. Much like the metamorphosis that turns a caterpillar into a butterfly. In other words, you don't just go to bed a blunder and wake up a wonder. There's a process. Would you look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, there is a process. Now, I want to say this, and I'm going to move on, that one of the challenges of many believers is some of us try to avoid the process, and others of us try to rush the process. But, beloved, in our walk with God, that leads us to our maturation and development in the things of God, there are some things, I know you're not going like it but I'm going to say it anyhow that cannot be avoided and they are part of the process and here's what I need to lay on you and I know you're going to resist it try to throw it back at me but I'm going to swat it right back at you because you need it and one of the things that God does in helping us come to a place of maturity and development is he does not only give us mountain moments but he gives us valley moments as well and sometimes, I know you don't want to hear it, but sometimes the way that God matures us, the way that God settles us, the way that God perfects us is by allowing things in our lives that are difficult and painful and challenging. Watch this, not to destroy us, but to make us better. So that having gone through it, we come out with a testimony of what God has done in our lives. Now, I think I've got one or two folk up here today who can testify while I was going through it, I didn't like it. But now that I look back on it, I'm so glad for it. Because it was only in the process that I learned how to trust in God, I learned how to lean on God, and I'm stronger and I'm better because of what I went through. I wish I had somebody up here today who could shout right there with me. Look at a neighbor. Say, neighbor, you see me shouting and you see me praising, but you have no idea what I went through to get the shout. God, I feel like preaching that and the praise I have. In fact, would you lean on a neighbor? Say, neighbor, this praise didn't come cheap. It cost me something. I had to go through some tests and some trials and some difficulty. But through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. Through it all, I've learned to trust in God. Through it all, I've learned to depend on his word. Do I have anybody up in here at the 10 o'clock service can look back over your life and give God a shout for what he brought you through? Y'all making me work hard for the third time this weekend. Tap a neighbor, say, neighbor, I learned more about God in the valley than I ever learned on the mountaintop. I've often quoted that old poem, who taught you how to pray? Trouble taught me how to pray. Who taught you how to sing? Sorrow taught me how to sing. You don't learn how to pray with a pocket full of money. You don't learn how to sing when your body is in good shape. But when your money is funny and your change is strange, when your body is wracked with pain, you can sing like the psalmist. I lift up mine eyes 
unto the hills from which cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord. And when you know where your help, don't y'all make me push this today. When you know where your help comes from, you can say like David, I will bless the Lord at all times. Would you lean on a neighbor, say neighbor. There's the promise and there's the process. So we looked second week at the process. Third week we looked at the practices. That when you are a new and better you, there are some things you put in practice that are obviously evident in your life on a regular recurring and ongoing situation. So today, having looked at the promise on week one, the process on week two, the practice on week three, I come now to week four, wrap it all up, tie it in a bow, let you take it home with you, and I want to look at the presence of a new you. And, and here, Marsha, here is my theological thesis. Here is my homiletical statement. Here is the center and the essence of the messages this weekend. Here it is. Sermon in a sentence. Here it is. The presence of a believer makes a difference. That's it. We go home now. That's the whole sermon. In one, I always tell our preachers, if you can't preach your sermon in a sentence, you can't preach it in an hour. You don't know what you're trying to say in a sentence. We'll never know what you're trying to say if you preach all night long. So here's the sentence that I want you to get. Are you ready? The presence of a believer makes a difference. Everyone say the presence of a believer makes a difference. I believe with all of my heart that when you and I are made new by the power of God, we make a difference in our world. Okay, let, let me say that again. We make a difference in our world. Let me, let me try it again. You missed it. Listen to my nomenclature. Hear my verbiage. When the power and the person, the presence of God is in my life. When I am a believer who is becoming by spiritual metamorphosis a new and better me, my presence makes a difference in my world. Oh God, Lord, I want to say something here. Which means, watch this, you may not, I may not have any influence, impact over the crisis in North Korea. Now, now, Chair, now I don't know, because, you know, we got some pretty, you know, highfalutin folk in here. I don't think, Daryl, anybody calling y'all to call Kim Il Young. Now, if they are, please call him. And if you can't call him, please call that man. I, I get pray. You, Deacon George, pop y'all pray because I feel myself going there. I, I do not understand him. What 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 is this schoolyard sandbox bully mentality? When you kicking dust in somebody's face, calling somebody out of their name like you in the third grade. My God, this is the world. You are the president. Would you think higher, talk higher, act higher? 
Okay, 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 okay. I'm gonna go for it because y'all, y'all ain't gonna. I asked y'all to pray, and obviously y'all ain't praying, and I forgot to take my medication. So hit it. And and Sam, Mike, I am not the sharpest knife in the drawer. Help me understand, deacons, why we have the potential of nuclear proliferation from North Korea, why we are dealing with hurricanes, floods, and fires, does our president travel to Alabama to talk about a football player? And I was telling, I was telling our sister, Reverend Felicia, that, it, that we must not be blinded by the optics of what went on. Because just like Ronald Wilson Reagan chose to go to Philadelphia, Mississippi, where those three civil rights workers were killed to announce his candidacy, it should not be lost on us that on Friday, our president went to Alabama to call a black man an SOP for speaking his mind. The same president who said that neo-Nazis and skinheads were pretty nice people but Colin Kaepernick is an SOP. The devil is a liar and somebody ought to call him the town. Musa. I feel better now. But I've been mad since Friday. And somebody ought to call Amarosa and Ben Carson and all the other black folk in the White House and tell them take a stand and stop sucking up to this foolishness because when the smoke clears and the dust settles, you're going to be black when he gone. Back to the text. Paul says, <laughs> Pop Rawls, pray hard. Paul says, there is promise, process, practice that produces presence. And the presence of a Christian makes a difference in his or her world. Maybe not in North Korea. Maybe we can't do anything about the floods and the fires and the hurricanes. Maybe we cannot resolve. We can't get his phone from him to stop him from tweeting. But you can make a difference in your world. Come on, church. Okay, all of us occupy a world, a sphere of influence, a place where we touch people and impact people and influence people. And here is my theological treatise, the thesis that I have today in the preaching of this passage is that the presence of a believer makes a difference in their world. That when a believer shows up on the scene, everything changes. I talked at 8 o'clock about the difference between being a thermometer and a thermostat. That Christians must stop, especially in this day and time, given the tenor and the tone of our culture, we can no longer be content being spiritual thermometers, merely, merely announcing what is the temperature. The world is bad. We got that. We're all going to hell. We know that. That's thermometer talk. A thermostat changes it. And God, beloved, calls you and I 
not to be spiritual thermometers. He calls us as Christians to be spiritual Helen thermostats. That we step into a room. Jesus, God have mercy. Our teachers step into a classroom with children who come from dysfunctional families. And the minute a Christian teacher steps in the classroom and takes the blackboard, the temperature changes because a thermometer just walked, a thermostat just walked in. That when, when, when a Christian attorney walks into the courtroom us in a nation filled with injustice and inequity and stands before the bar of justice, a thermostat just walked in the room. When a businesswoman who's the CEO of her own company is a Christian and walks into a bank, it doesn't matter that the misogynist, chauvinistic men don't want to help her. When she walks in, a thermostat, oh God, just walked in and minds get changed and attitude and the whole environment because the thermostat just walked. Would you, would you give a neighbor some sanctified debt and tell him, be a thermostat? Being a thermometer. We know it's bad. My God, we can read. Somebody tell us, how do we change this? How do we alter this? How do we impact this? So I've been arguing. I'm almost through. I've been arguing. That, um, thank you, Helen. Helen said, take my time. I'm going to listen to Helen. <laughs> Notice none of y'all said nothing. <laughs> I've been arguing, I've been arguing since last night that um, in reality, in reality, there is a triune nature to our call uh, to practice presence. You remember, uh, was it Brother Lawrence uh, who talked about the practice of presence? We pray in, in, in uh, when, when you're in seminary and you do uh, clinical care, pastoral clinical care, they teach you about the practice of presence, that you don't have to walk in a room and always say something, just walk in and be there. Because sometimes words are not necessary, needed, or appreciated. One of the things young preachers think is whenever we show up, we got to say something. Sometimes when people are hurting, they don't need to hear anything. They just need to know you're there. So, um, so, so, so I, I, I've, been, I've been arguing. I've been arguing this week, last night, today. I've been arguing. I've been arguing that, um, that there, are three, there are three levels to this, uh, this presence piece. Felicia, Marva, there are three, pre, three, three aspects to it. Uh, last night we talked about shine. Everybody say shine. Shine, Paul says, among whom you shine as lights in the midst of a crooked and perverse. That, that's the tone and tenor of the culture that we live in, a crooked and perverse generation. We shine. And then at 8 o'clock this morning, I argued, Mom Gwen, that having shown because we shine, uh, the, 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 the ability to shine, I want to say this right, the that's the word I'm looking for, not ability, capacity. The capacity to shine is what gives us the ability to do the next thing. That's what I was looking for. It is the, everybody say capacity. The capacity to shine. The fact that I have, are y'all still with me? The, the, fact, the fact that I have choir, let me talk to y'all because I told you last week, y'all always get the back of the gospel. So let me turn and face y'all. Like y'all the jury. <laughs> Let me turn and talk to ladies and gentlemen of the jury. Um, within us, within us, Willie, within us, Sharon, Mom, watch this, within us is innately, intuitively, the potential, the possibility. It is often latent, but it's there. It is often dormant, but it is there. It is there. J j much like Brandy, when, when I am born, I have talents. Like you can sing. See, you didn't start singing at 14 when you were born. Where were you born? What city? Uh, you had to stop and think? <laughs> She's the... Uh, <laughs> Stop it. So when you were born in Springfield, um, the day you were born, watch this, singing was in you. No, come here, come here. Come here for a minute. 
Y'all, I'm at home. I would never do this in a, um, in a church I wasn't a pastor. Come here. <laughs> you know, yes, Jesus loves me? Sing one more. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. For the Bible tells me so. Give her a hand. Watch this. Watch this. Watch this. Y'all heard that? That was in her the day she was born. Now she couldn't talk, but, she, but singing was in her. It was dormant, it was latent, it was undiscovered, it was unreleased, but it was there. And to the same degree, are y'all still with me? To the same degree and the same measure, the capacity, the capability, the possibility, the potential of shining is in you the moment you are saved. Here's what happens though. Like Brandy's ability to sing undiscovered and undisciplined and uncultivated, she could live and die and never sing a note. And the fact she died and never sang doesn't mean she can't. It means she didn't. Would you turn to a neighbor and say, and what might be in you? No, because there may be something in you you've never tapped into and you could die with it and never release it. The, the possibility, the potential, the capability, the promise of shining is in us from birth. And because we have that, it then allows us to do what I talked about at eight. I'm almost through. And that is to show. Because when I shine, I show. I'm not just called to shine, let my light shine. In the course of my, are y'all still awake? In the course of my, now I need you to follow me because there is a sequential order to the thesis and that, that I'm presenting to you today. And if you don't get the order, you'll miss what I'm trying to say. That because I have the ability to shine, that then releases the ability to show. I, well, Peter says, I show forth the praises of him who called me out of darkness into his marvelous light. But I can't show until I shine. Once I shine, I start showing. No, no different than if I plunge this room in. Who, who's up there? Who's who, who's? Is that West? I don't have my glasses on. Is that West? West, can you turn all the lights out except the cross? No, turn everything out, including the cross. Turn everything out. Everything out. Don't get scared. Y'all scared of the dog? <laughs> what are you doing? Oh, my mama! Stop. <laughs> turn out everything. 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 Oh, don't you go to sleep in here. <laughs> now, Wes, just turn the cross on. Just the cross. Now, turn everything else out. Is, uh, is that connected to these lights here? It's messing up my illustration. Watch this. <laughs> Watch this. Okay, pretend it's still dark. Watch this. Because it's dark doesn't negate the light. In fact, the darker the room, the greater the light. Wait a minute. No matter how small it is. You can turn the lights back up. See, 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 that cross lit when the whole room is lit doesn't mean anything. Let this room get dark. Y'all be shouting for that cross and not because Jesus died on it, because you can see by it. So watch this. 
when you when you live, remember what Paul Paul says, we live in a wicked, crooked, perverse generation. It's dark, so we shine like lights in the world. Watch this. A little bit of light in a dark place is a wonderful thing. That's why we used to sing this little light of mine. I'm going to let it shine. So Paul says, I, everybody say, I shine. I shine. Everyone say, I show. I show. And then here's the third thing, we share. That's the second thing. We are not only sent to shine in the world. We're not only sent to show the world. We're also sent to share with the world. Three things, and I let you go home. Here's the first one. We share the light of God. Yes. Hallelujah. According to the text, the world is in a condition, Paul seems to suggest, that requires light. And so we as believers, now the world can't do this, only we can. We as believers share the light of God with the world. Now there are three specific people's groups that we must share with. Are you ready? Write these down. Holy Ghost will have to teach them because I've taken too much time on the introduction. The first people's group that we are to share light with, the light of, now beloved, please, not your light, God's light. The first people we share the light of God with is those in darkness. Isaiah talks about the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light. Those upon whom uh, um, darkness had come, uh, the light of the resurrection has shown. All right? So watch this. Watch this. My job, now, now church, please hear me, is to go into dark places and light a light. But you can't be scared. I never forget, you won't know this name, the late Colonel T.B. Boyd. Only old folk might know his name. T.B. Boyd, you remember T.B. Boyd, was a chaplain. Afri he was one of the first African-American chaplains in the Church of God. He rose to the rank of colonel. And uh, he came and preached for us one Sunday. He and Dad were great friends, uh, Chaplain T.B. Boyd. And he told this story about a little boy in London who couldn't sleep and was watching, this is back in the days of gas lights, when the city of London hired men who had long sticks, poles, and they would go and light the street lights. And this little boy sat in his room watching the city of London in dark, and this man with this long pole walking around lighting, and he said to his dad, Daddy, Daddy, come quick. Watch this. There's a man punching holes in the darkness. That's what you and I are called to do, Mom Erin. We're to go into dark places and punch holes in the darkness. We bring the light of God to those in darkness. Here's the second thing. We bring the light of God to those in deception. How many of you know there's few darkness, deeper, darker than the darkness of deception? Boy, look at y'all. See, some of y'all, but Don, media past chairman, some, some of these folks been in church all their life. There are people who don't know the truth. They never heard the truth. I need y'all to wake up on this. And our job is to bring light to folk, not just in darkness, but in deception. Here's the third thing. And to bring light, people in deception, people in darkness, and people in despair. People without hope, without God and without hope in the world. And our job is to light a light so we say to them, it doesn't matter what you've done, there's hope for you. Y'all missed it. Y'all missed it. Y'all missed it. Here's the second thing I hurry. We share the love of God. John 3.16, for God so loved the world, finish it for me, that he did what? That he gave his only... That whosoever, y'all getting scared, believeth in him should not, but what church? Here's the third thing you share. So many Christians, Marva, so many Christians don't do this. Here's why, Bill Watkins, because we say, now nah, we tell folk that. They're going to do what they want to do. And they ain't going to, psst, psst, psst. Newsflash, folk going to do what they're going to do anyhow. 
You telling them God loves them is not going to make them do anything more. It may be the thing they need to hear to turn their lives around. Never be afraid to share God's love like it gives them license to do wrong. They're already doing wrong. Write these three things down. Everybody say, we share God's love. We share God's love. Watch this, that God loves you despite sin. Oh, got real quiet, got real quiet. Got... I talked about that today. Doesn't matter what sin it is. Come on, all have sinned. Not y'all have sinned, all have sinned. Amen. And, and your sin might not have been their sin. Their sin might not have been their sin, but everybody got a sin. T tell the neighbor, say, everybody on this road got a set of sin. Everybody, come on, just look down. Say, all of y'all, all you deacons, all of y'all had a sin. That's why you got saved. Some of y'all was drinking high as Cootie Brown. Some of y'all, so, so, some of y'all ran moonshine. Some of y'all played the numbers. Some of y'all ran the numbers. Why y'all looking at me like that? Some of y'all were reefer conjure smoking Rosfetarians. <laughs> Come on, y'all. Some of y'all were midnight ramblers and all night gamblers. Everybody was something. But thank God for Jesus. I wish I had a third of a church right there. Tap a neighbor, say he loved me despite my sin. He didn't let my sin turn him off. He didn't let my sin turn him away. He got in the muck and mire and brought me out of my sin. And that's why I praise him. And that's why I worship him. And that's why I serve him. And hey y'all, if he did it for you, he'll do it for somebody else. We got we to gotta, we gotta share God's love that, that he loves us despite our sin. Watch this. He loves us despite our struggle. I wish I could sit down with y'all and counsel y'all. I don't do it anymore. I wish I could because I would take y'all to Starbucks, get y'all a latte, and I'd sit y'all down. And I would tell you two things. First of all, everybody got struggle. Everybody, everybody. In fact, I would whisper in your ears. I wouldn't let the, what they call the barristers, I wouldn't let them hear me tell it. I'd say, come here. Everybody got a struggle, including the bishop talking to you. <laughs> Here's the second thing I'll tell you before I got up and left after I paid the bill is, and God is greater than your struggle. Now get to stepping. <laughs> Stop sitting around here whining and complaining. Everybody got struggle. God is bigger than your struggle. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. If God is for you, he's more than the world against you. Square your shoulders, lift up your head, get some pep in your step, and act like you're a child of God because he's bigger than your struggle. God loves me despite my struggle. And I, I've been saying this, I, and Deacon Murray, De Deacon Gibson, Deacon, all you deacons, Deacon Logan, all of y'all, I say it all the time, and we got to stop condemning new converts and young saints because they have a struggle. Because the presence of a struggle means they trying to live right. Because before they didn't struggle, they just did it. The fact you struggling means that you're making progress. Tap a neighbor, say, I'm struggling. Now, nah, come on, confess, say, I'm struggling. Say, I wanted to cuss them out Friday, but, but I didn't. It was a struggle. It was right here. I wanted to slap her, but I, I struggled. I had to reach my hand back, but the Holy Ghost grabbed it. It was a struggle, but the presence of the struggle denotes I'm making progress. He loves you despite your struggle. And then he loves you despite your situation. Some of us came in today from some ugly situations. 
but he loves us despite them. And he loves us in them. And he'll love us through them. Well, I close. Here's the third thing. We share not only the love of God, and we not only share the light of God, but we're called upon to shine, to show, to share the life of God. John 10.10, 10, verse 9, the thief comes but to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come. This is Jesus. In juxtaposition, I have come that you might have life. Hallelujah. That you might have it more abundantly. And our job, our job, our job, sort of like Mission Impossible with Peter Graves, if you choose to accept it, your assignment. <laughs> this recording is going to self-destruct in the next 30 seconds. But if you choose this assignment, your assignment is to go in the world and share the life of God. And there are, three, there are three components of that life, and I close. It's a life that overcomes. Wow. Wow. We sing a song, Marvin, you remember it. Your daddy sang it, the late Pastor John Laster, your mother, who's now struggling with dementia and Alzheimer's, with that beautiful voice of hers. I listened to that tape you played. It made me want to cry. Hear that voice so clear, so crisp, so her punctuation so distinct. You sing that song, be an overcomer, only cowards yield. When the foe they meet on the battlefield, we are blood-bought princes of the royal host. Must falter not, nor desert our post. Overcome, never yield a step in the hottest fight. God will send you help from the rims of light. In Jehovah's might, put your foe to flight. And a victor's crown, you wear it last. The life we're called to live is an overcoming life. God, I wish I had more than two people said amen to that. But most Christians don't live it. Most of us are being overcome instead of being overcomers. And we, God, Jesus, can I say this and you won't get mad? And we got to stop waking up every morning, letting the devil punk us out and get us to a place where we're subject to him rather than him being subject to us. He has, God has given us dominion and authority. Come on and talk back to me and I will not let stuff overcome me when I have been made to be an overcomer. We're to live an overcoming life. Are you in the room with me? We're to live a life that overflows. Ah, it overflows. Can I tell you what I mean? I mean, you know, I got just enough for me. Pity a Christian. Only got enough for them ourselves. Ah, child, you better pray yourself. I ain't got enough for me. Really? Child, I ain't got, you, better, you better learn to get a hold of God for yourself. I'm trying to make it myself. Now, this is an overflow in life. Jesus said it'll be in you like a well of water. I wish I had Bible springing up, overflowing. Come on, tell your neighbors, I got enough for you and me. Come on, that, that, that's what church ought to be. That if I, oh God, I, I, I better leave this alone. That if I come in here dragging one Sunday and sit next to Pastor Kelly, I don't want Pastor Kelly looking at me saying, man, I'm in the same shape you. I need him to say, look, looks like you down, bro. But I want you to know I'm prayed up this week and I'm going to go on up there and preach. I'm going to pray you through this because it may be my week next week and I'm going to need you to pray me through. Would you grab have one neighbor by the hand say hey neighbor you can count on me uh, when you have a bad day uh, that I'll cover you uh, and pray you through it uh, is there anybody here I guess y'all gonna make me work anyhow huh? even though I'm tired and I got jet lag y'all gonna make me work anyhow well let's go on to work then tell a neighbor neighbor on your bad day uh, you can lean on me uh, because I'll be prayed up uh, and I'll pray you through it uh, because I'm not in this uh, by myself uh, or for myself uh, because we are related uh, to each other you and me uh, we're the body uh, 
of Jesus Christ his son would you look at one neighbor and say neighbor on your low day I won't walk away from you but I'll cover you in prayer I'll stand in faith with you I'll be there for you until you get up out of it because by the grace of God I just checked the forecast I didn't talk to Al Roker I didn't talk to Jim Gano but I looked in the word and the Holy Spirit told me the clouds are getting ready to clear and the storm is passing over hallelujah I need you to tell somebody it's gonna be all right because weeping may endure for the night but joy comes in the morning is there anybody here that has tried him and found out he'll make a way out of no way tell a neighbor neighbor I've got a life that overcomes I've got a life that overflows and good afternoon y'all may the Lord bless you real good I've got a life that will last over eternity because this joy that I have the world didn't give it to me and the world can't take it away I've got joy like a river I've got peace like a river I've got hope like a river I know I got a brother in the White House that doesn't seem to be all there I've got a dictator in North Korea that doesn't seem to be all there we got situations all in the world that are leaving us shaking but in spite of Trump and in spite of anybody else I've got a father who sits on the throne I've got a God who's able to do exceeding abundantly above and beyond anything I can ask I feel like preaching today dare to imagine so yes the clouds are hanging low yes the storm is raging yes the sun is not shining and there's trouble everywhere but I ask myself the question I used to hear my grandma ask while she was ironing and shirts uh, to keep food in our stomach uh, and a roof over our head uh, why should I be discouraged uh, why should the shadows fall uh, why should my heart be lonely and long uh, for heaven and home uh, if Jesus is my portion uh, my constant friend uh, is he uh, he I is on the sparrow and I know he watches me so I sing because I'm happy I sing because I'm free his eye is on the sparrow and I know would you high five a neighbor say there's a lot I don't know I don't know trigonometry I don't know calculus I don't know geometry I don't know physics but I know he's watching over me and I got one question do you know what it is ain't he all right ain't he all right is on the sparrow
know he's watching over me. So I'm not going to get all out of sorts. I'm not going to curse the darkness. I'm not going to capitulate to the culture. I'm going to hold to God's unchanging hand. And I'm going to trust him to see me through this like he saw me through the last one. And I'm going to shine, show, and share what God has done in my life. Everybody stand.